Good morning. This is the Keeping It Real Sunday School class from Cornerstone Baptist Church in Richland, Missouri. I'm Dr. Max Thornsbury and I'm the teacher and my wife Brenda will be reading the scriptures this morning out of the original King James, a Schofield Bible. Um, I'd ask uh, this lesson says everybody needs to get a study Bible and that'd be an excellent one to get, the King James Version Schofield. A few of the more complicated old English words are translated a little differently, but uh, man, does they have a lot of cross-references and an excellent commentary in the middle of the Bible. We're going to be looking at 2 Timothy today. We're continuing our study on the significance and importance of the Word of God. You will remember that 2 Timothy is the last scripture that the Apostle Paul wrote. It's a personal letter to Timothy, the pastor, or at least a co-pastor or pastor at the church, First Baptist Church in Ephesus. And um, he is responsible for a lot of other uh, pastors that are scattered around in house churches all over the region. History tells us that Ephesus at that time was about uh, 200,000 people, which is as large as Springfield, Missouri. It's hard to comprehend that, but a huge, huge metropolitan city of trade and the center of the worship of the goddess Diana. So uh, as I said before, you might think Diana was a Venus type of god. She wasn't. She's a little squat fat gal with multiple breasts and she was the goddess of fertility and uh, they made little idols to her out of silver and sold them and everybody put them in their house. Uh, lots of history about that in the New Testament. Too much information. Yes. Yeah. TMI. <laughs> well, I was very surprised about what Diana looked like. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to start today um, looking at 2 Timothy chapter 2, 14 through 15. You remember that after we get through the General Electric Power Company, we have the Triple T's, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, and then Titus. We're going to read the very first chapter, or Titus' very first verse of the letter to Titus in just a minute. Well, let's start out in 2 Timothy 2, 14 through 15. Of these things you put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. What was common in this Greek culture, Brenda, was uh, debating and arguing and having formal debates about the meaning of words, the meaning of things, significance. Um, you remember when uh, Paul went to Mars Hill f prior to spending a year and a half or more in uh, Corinth. We think he spent two years there total. Um, he went to Mars Hill and he debated with the philosophers and the Epicureans. And remember that's where he said, in him we live and move and have our being. In him no, we no, live oh, no, no, and move <laughs> and have I'll be. Oh, I thought that was a prompt for that. <laughs> and uh, what was happening is these Christians in Ephesus, being in this Greek culture, were uh, taking the letters that Paul had written, and even some of the Old Testament, and they were arguing and debating about the meaning of specific words and points. You're also going to see here in a little bit that the... Um, Gnostic movement had already started in the church, which we'll look at in a little more detail as we get into this lesson. But part of that movement um, was to indicate that everything that we did in this life really had no meaning. We could do as we pleased. We could do with our body as we pleased. The body was terribly bad. Um, what does Paul write to the Corinthians? It's the temple of Christ. Mm -hmm. It's not terribly bad. It is of the flesh and it is sinful. but it is what Christ and the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit resides in. Um, that's what he's talking about here, Brenda. And he says, um, put them in remembrance. This in the Greek tense has a, um, an indication of keep on remembering, mm -hmm. uh, keep repeating this. Do we need to keep going to church and hearing the word every week? Of course. You can't just go through this one time and have it, can you? Oh, it's no. like I always oh, no. tell everybody the Word of God is like an onion. Mm -hmm. You peel off a layer, and there's, there's a layer nothing. underneath it, and there's a layer underneath it, and the Holy Spirit continues to reveal to you truth in the Scripture. But study the show, show thyself approved, um, a workman. So is study of the Scriptures important? 
Oh, absolutely. And it's one of the reasons why our founding fathers in this country set up a school system. Mm -hmm. uh, they wanted everyone educated. You have to be educated. You have to be literate in order to read the Word. That's why the Wycliffe Bible translators go throughout the world translating the Bible into the language of those people so that they can study it. The Holy Spirit can reveal it to them. One thing about the Jewish people, they were literate. Mm -hmm. And in the Roman Empire, the lesson writer says about 75 to 80 percent of the people could not read or write. Mm. That's one reason why the Roman Empire always appointed Jews to be the merchant men of whatever area they were in because they were educated. They mm -hmm. had gone to school for at least eight years, and many of them gone on for longer. The Apostle Paul here has a Ph.D. in the law in the College of Gamiel, a man of letters. Uh, you can tell it by how he writes, too, because every word that he writes here, we could do a word study on every word. Just the concept of study, the concept of workman, the concept of approved. Um, what do you think he means by rightly dividing the word of truth? What is the word of truth? Well, the word of truth is Scripture. Yeah, it's the gospel message mm -hmm. particularly, but it's any scripture, Old Testament, Septuagint, uh, and New Testament. As we studied last week, the Apostle Peter had already assigned the epistles of Paul as being holy scripture, even before they were canonized in, uh, in 346 A.D. when Constantine drew all the church together at Nicaea, in the middle of Turkey, what we know as Turkey today. Brenda, read uh, 2 Timothy 1, 8 through 10. We have already had this in a lesson, but I'd like to read it again. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. This gospel message is pretty significant, isn't it? Of course. It's what leads us to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ after the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin and points to righteousness. And so study is a very important part of our church life. We have Sunday school. We have cell group. At, night, at Sunday night, and we listen to our pastor expound on the Word every day. This is characteristic of synagogue kind of worship, uh, particularly after the captives returned from Babylon. Not everyone could get to the temple. Mm -hmm. Now, they made an effort to get there on Passover and Pentecost and, you know, those kinds of uh, important days in the Jewish calendar. But um, most of the people lived out there in the Roman Empire a long way from Jerusalem. And their connection to the temple, their connection to God, was through these Levites and priests and rabbis, which Jesus was a rabbi, uh, that taught the scriptures, expounded on the scriptures, explained the scriptures to the average person. He doesn't want them debated. He doesn't want them, uh, you know, he, he talks about here about um, strive not about words because there is no profit in it. And it eventually leads people away from an understanding of the Lord. You see that happen when people go to seminary. I call yeah. it cemetery. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they go in there with full faith in Christ and they come out with all these doubts because somebody has spent all this time arguing and debating about the meaning of words mm -hmm. instead of allowing the Holy Spirit to expound the Scripture within your heart, your mind, and your spirit. Very, very significant point, Brenda. Mm -hmm. Very significant point. Um, why do you think people like to uh, do this debating and expounding and arguing and things about the meaning of specific words? Um, half the time they spend in cemetery is on Greek or Hebrew and the meaning of specific words and the tense and the on and on it goes. Um, it is important for us to understand mm -hmm. these scriptures mm -hmm. in their original language. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the original letters in the New Testament was written in Koinonia Greek and the Old Testament in Hebrew, some of it in Aramaic. Heck, Nebuchadnezzar wrote Daniel chapter 4, mm -hmm. and it's still scripture. Mm -hmm. um, it is important to have a commentary, mm -hmm. and this Schofield Bible is an excellent one. All those references you see in the side and in mm -hmm. the center, 
bringing you references back and forth to all these scriptures and what they mean. Um, turn to Timothy, 1 Timothy, just back a little ways. Ch chapter 4, verse 5, please. No, excuse me. Chapter 6, verse 4. Boy, I transposed those, didn't I? Mm -hmm. Chapter 6, verse 4. He is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and disputes of words, of which come cometh envy, strife, railings, evil, suspicions. A lot of times people argue about the meaning of these scriptures, sometimes to show their education, sometimes to detract from the Word. Mm -hmm. and we have people today that have twisted and turned the scripture to mean about anything, that holy matrimony is not between a man and a woman. Yeah. Um, and, and some of it is because we want the Scripture to say something that we want it to say yeah. rather than what it says. Mm -hmm. You know, sure. if we want to support uh, some type of lifestyle and we know it's sinful, we know the Bible speaks against it, we twist and turn the Scripture so we can say, well, in this modern day, this is what it means. Mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of like the Constitution, the Scripture's meaning never changes. Right. Um, this uh, workman, what do you think a workman is, Brenda? What well, is a workman? when I think of a workman, I think of a laborer, yeah. someone who does the job. Somebody that's out there working to make a living. Mm -hmm. That's a workman. Mm -hmm. And he's saying that Timothy is working for Christ as he expounds, preaches, ministers, pastors, uh, and you're going to see in a minute as he teaches. So uh, a very important uh, point. It's not something that implies a passiveness, okay? No. I'm going to go out today and I'm going to work on a tractor, hopefully get it running, because I've got some lines messed up for the diesel injector pump. Got new lines, new fittings, I'm going to put it in. You're going to help me. We're going to put diesel down in those lines. We're going to bleed them out. Hopefully the old tractor starts up and we'll be in business. We're going to work at it. All that's going to require action. Mm -hmm. I'm going to work on trying to put a deck on this little cabin we made for the kids. I'm going to have to saw the boards. I'm going to have to rip boards. I'm going to have to get screws to put it all together. I'm going to have to build a set of steps. That's a workman. It requires action. And it's the same with uh, working for God, doing the work of the Scripture. It's not a passive thing. It's an active thing. You agree with that? I do. Good. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, Paul could also... Have, Timothy could also have in his hands some of what we have in the New Testament. He wouldn't have the book of John. He wouldn't have Revelations. That didn't come along until A.D. 90, and this is in the early 60s, A.D. 60s. Um, but he probably had Mark, which was written within 10 years, we think, of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. He probably has Matthew. He probably has a lot of Paul's epistles. I know he had the book of the Romans and the Corinthians, probably, First and Second Corinthians. Um, so he's got scriptures to refer to. He's got scriptures to study. Mm -hmm. Paul says in 1 Timothy and again in 2 Timothy that all this Greek-oriented debate, all this Greek-oriented uh, philosophy, the scripture is what the scripture is, mm -hmm. and the Holy Spirit will reveal it to us. Mm -hmm. You can't interpret it. I think the Apostle Paul wrote that scripture is not of any private interpretation not of any private interpretation. Okay, let's go to Timothy chapter 2. I had you read down through what, 15? 15. Mm -hmm. uh, read 16 to 19, please. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness, and their word will eat as doth a, gang a death gang gangrene yep. of whom are Hymenaeus and Philetus. Yeah. You got him. Who, <laughs> who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. Having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. Let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Now this Hymenius and Philetus are named in other parts of the scripture. I, I don't know. If, look in 1 Timothy 1, 19 and 20, Brenda. There, First Timothy. Oh, that's Thessalonians. Somehow, to, how did I get there? Well, we're going to talk about yeah. First Thessalonians here in a minute. But First Timothy one nineteen and twenty. Holding faith and a good conscience, with 
which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck, of whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Wow, I didn't see that coming. <laughs> <laughs> they shipwreck the gospel because yeah, they're preaching yeah. things that are not in the Word. Mm -hmm. um, this idea that the um, uh, rapture had already come and they'd all missed it, is why the Apostle Paul wrote 1 Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and chapter 5, which we read at graveside when we have a funeral, mm -hmm. identifies exactly how it's going to take place. and exact. They were preaching there's no resurrection of the body. In mm -hmm. other words, there's a resurrection of the spirit, but there's no res because the body is evil. This Gnostic thing about the body is, that is not true. Mm -mm. That when you saw Jesus in a body, a human body, it was actually a an aberration that you were seeing. You weren't really seeing anything physical. It's just what your eyes thought they saw, your mind. Because Christ could never occupy a human body. It's worthless, no good. You can do with it as you please. You can have all the prostitutes and adultery and everything else you want. It don't mean anything because it's the spirit that counts. Mm -hmm. That's the teaching that was going around already. And John addresses this. He who said Christ did not come in the flesh is a liar and the truth is not in him in 1 John. Um, so already we have these men who are supposed to be Christians, and we talked last week that people that are promoting false doctrine cannot be Christians. Yeah. Now we could be an heir from time to time and not quite have a complete understanding. We haven't got far enough down in the layers. But when you start preaching some teaching and preaching something that he said is blasphemy, mm -hmm. how can you be a saved person? I don't know. The Holy Can't. Spirit would not allow that in you. We have pastors standing in the pulpit today saying that God wants us all to be wealthy, healthy, and wise. Mm -hmm. That's not true. God may have something to teach you through any one of those things. Mm -hmm. What He wants is you to be humble and totally and completely dependent on Him. However He decides to do that in your life is up to Him, not you. You don't make God do anything. No. So. Here we are, Brenda. What does it say there on your school field? The year that was written, Second Timothy is written about 64 A.D.? 67. 67 A.D. So that's the same year that the Apostle Paul, we think, was martyred. And this is his last scripture that he wrote to Timothy. Um, what are we there? If Christ's death, burial, and resurrection was in 33 or 34 A.D., we're about 33 years later, about the about life that. of Christ later mm -hmm. in time. Mm -hmm. um, and already these heresies have entered the church. Already you have people that claim to know the Lord, that are wolves in sheep clothing. And what he, how do you define them right there? He said they're shipwreck. Yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a pretty strong word. It is. You're shipwreck. So we have to be very careful. He also said that this kind of behavior... He calls it in the old English a canker, but what it means is exactly how Dr. Schofield translated it, gangrene. Mm -hmm. And when you have gangrene, what happens? You have a clostridium organism growing in your tissue. And as it grows, it produces a toxin and it kills another layer of tissue. And then it eats on that tissue and then it kills another layer. So what do you do with gangrene? You've got to cut it out. Mm -hmm. Well, now we don't cut it out so often. We still do have to do that. We fill it full of iodine, oxidize it, and those clostridials can't live in the presence of oxygen. Mm -hmm. That comes from working by the Confederate um, uh, Medical Service in, in the Civil War. They, Northern Medical Service, Southern Medical Service communicated with one another and shared all the things they learned. One of them was you could take somebody's gangrene, put iodine in there, and iodine would make oxygen and it would kill the gangrene. If you did it, you could do the same thing with tetanus. But he's saying this arguing and debating and these philosophies and Blaspheming the word of God is like gangrene. Mm -hmm. It just, it just eat. And what's it? What does that mean, Brenda? What's he implying by that? It has to be cut off. Yeah, has to be it's cut be off. Removed. And uh, that's pretty, pretty strong language coming from the Apostle Paul. Okay, a um, couple of important words here. Um, we've already discussed, but turn to Romans six one and two, Brenda. We've already discussed that this Gnostic belief was that the body was inherently evil, it was nothing good, that the body wasn't resurrected, that you could do really anything you want to do with the body. 
The Apostle Paul has some things to say about that in Romans chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer in it? And then turn to Matthew 27, Brenda, and read 52 to 53. When they say the body is not resurrected, it does not comply with Scripture because there was a, what scholars call a mini-resurrection that occurred on the day that Christ was crucified. And as His blood ran down off of Mount Calvary and healed then hers mother and sister, other things happened at the same time. And read that for us. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints that slept were raised, and came out of the graves after His resurrection, and went into the holy city, and appeared to many. So what's it say was raised there, Brenda? It says bodies of the saints. You don't need to raise the Spirit, do you? The Spirit is here all the time. Mm -hmm. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. You don't, there's no resurrection of the Spirit. There's a resurrection of the body. Mm -hmm. And the Spirit and body unite. The Spirit is eternal. From the moment of conception on, the Spirit is eternal. It never dies. Mm -hmm. um, it's either going to spend eternity with Christ or it's going to spend an eternity separated from Christ in hell. But it never dies. Yeah. And this body has died. These bodies are dead and put mm -hmm. in the tomb. And what happens? Well, it, they decay. They decay. Yeah. And that's not, I've smelt a decaying human body in Haiti, and it is not a pretty thing. Mm -mm. I've seen decaying human bodies, and they're not pretty. Mm -mm. But when they come back, they're going to be perfect. Yeah. Now, these people went into the city of Jerusalem. Now, did they have to die again? Is this a resurrection like Lazarus had? Brought back to life, and then he, he's, he gets life, but he's going to die again. I don't know. I don't have the answer to that. I think those are people like Lazarus. I think the miracle of his blood, the miracle of the time, notice it says saints. And so saints are those that are believers. Mm -hmm. And I think they had to die again, but they were resurrected. Their bodies came back. Their spirits came back to meet their body. They walked out of the tomb, and they walked around Jerusalem. So, Surprising a lot of folks, I, how do I, the would, Gnostics I would assume. say, then, that there's no resurrection of the body? Um, they're of the devil. Yeah, they're wrong. They're of, the, they're of Satan. They're of the enemy. Okay, Brennan, um, let's read. I'm going to have you... They skip some verses here, but I'm not going to skip them. Let's read uh, 20 through 26, please. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and fit for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Flee also youthful lust, but follow righteousness, faith, love, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they breed strifes. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose him, if God, perhaps, will give them repentance unto the not acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. Now, what the Apostle Paul says is that this misinterpretation of Scripture, this misappropriation of Scripture, like we see in many churches today, is, where does it come from? Well, it comes from the devil. Yeah, it's, it's satanic. Uh, that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. It's always done for a selfish reason when Scripture is misinterpreted or interpreted wrong. Mm -hmm. Usually as a condoning or an excuse for your own sin. Mm -hmm. um, also saying, you know, like God made me this way. Yeah. Well, let's turn to the book of James, Brenda, and let's see what it says about God making you a sinner. Uh, because James does not agree with that. And um, start with uh, verse 13 and read through 16. Uh, first, James. Uh, cha first chapter of the book of James. Okay. 
Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. I believe that pretty well says that you cannot say that God made you some way that causes you to live a lifestyle that's in opposition to the Word. It pretty much says that, yes. God does not tempt any man. God mm -hmm. does not make a man to be sinful. No. Uh, we are sinful, but we're sinful because of what? Our own lust mm -hmm. and our own flesh. Mm -hmm. So, a very important point here that the Apostle Paul is trying to, trying to make. He also uses some pretty key words here. Flee youthful lust. Um, you know, I did some pretty foolish things when I was in my teens. One of the best things I ever did is get married when I was 13. Oh, oh but, please don't say that. <laughs> well, it was, just, it was just a few years later. Well, that must have been your first wife then. It must have been a few years <laughs> later. Just barely 18. Well, that's different. Um, lack of judgment, puberty, hormones. Uh, I remember I was going to sell my, my heifer and buy me a motorcycle. Yeah, my dad had to set me down and talk me out of it. I had a heifer, ch heifer chain, heifer show whatever. I was going to sell it and buy a motorcycle. Well, I'm glad you didn't do that. Yeah, me too. I mean, flee youthful lust, right? Mm -hmm. Try to follow what is righteous. Do what the Holy Spirit is telling you to do. And again, don't be involved in these foolish uh, questions. He says in the Old English, knowing that they do gender strife. What does that mean? I don't know. What did Schofield translate that? Produce, breed. 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 There you go. That's exactly what it means. Mm -hmm. It means that once you do that, then it just replicates itself, mm -hmm. just reproduces itself. Uh, a big, big issue. And he also says that the servant of the Lord, and here he's speaking of Timothy, who is a pastor, an overseer, a bishop, an elder, that um, they should be apt to teach. He, he uses that same um, description over here in 1 Timothy when it gives the qualifications for a pastor. Apt to teach. What does that mean? Uh, prepared to teach and studying so that they can teach. I mean, it's there again, it's an action. Yeah, he, he said in other scriptures that a pastor should not be a novice. Right. It means you don't get saved one day and go to the pulpit the next. Correct. What do you say? Study to show thyself approved, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I remember when I was a kid, there would be some 16-year-old kid somewhere that went up to church and said, God's called me to preach, and the next week they got him in the pulpit somewhere in Sweetburg or Independence or someplace, him up there screaming and hollering, not knowing a thing about the Word, not mm -hmm. having any understanding of how to discern the Scriptures and to study. This. That's not what we're supposed to do. A pastor is not to be a novice. There's, there's some studying, some effort, some... Uh, correction. Also, they need to be subject unto their elders, subject mm -hmm. unto the pastors. In the Southern Baptist Church, that usually means subject unto the deacons, and that's not proper, um, but they are subject to Christ, and they are subject to the church, are they not? Yes. Anytime a pastor does something that is not correct scripturally, he's to be corrected by the church. Mm -hmm. Deacons might be the most appropriate ones to do that, mm -hmm. but the correction needs to occur. Mm -hmm. And that's what he's saying. Apt to teach means exactly what you said it is. You've got to have the gift of teaching. I often say I've known preachers that couldn't pastor well and pastors who couldn't preach well. Um, some of that can be overcome with time and study and effort. Mm -hmm. Some people simply don't have the gift of speaking. Mm -hmm. The Apostle Paul said he didn't have that gift. You know, he let other people stand up and speak for him, but he sure had the gift of writing, didn't he? Mm -hmm. And so there are ways the Holy Spirit uses us. I wasn't, he, Paul says, I did not have eloquent language. I did not have an eloquent uh, presence. We think he was bald and kind of short and he couldn't see very well. But you can tell who I am by the power of the Holy Spirit that resides in me and the gifts and the signs and wonders that the Holy Spirit has done through me. Not many people lay down on a kid, falls off a third floor window, and comes back to life. No. Not many people could pray over handkerchiefs and have them sent out and people get them, put them on them, and be healed. Mm -hmm. So God uses people in different ways. We're not an apostle. We're not going to be an apostle Paul. We're, the apostles are, are done. 
had a special dispensation, a special calling, a special impact. But all of us should have some ability to teach. And in order to do that, we got to study. Mm-hmm. How, how many, when did you think you first memorized your first Bible verse? Oh, my goodness. Three, four years old? Uh, it I depends know on which, it depends on when, it, you know. Three or four years old, you're standing like our grandkids. Yeah at that age could mm-hmm. stand up and recite some Bible verses. Mm-hmm. We're beginning the process of studying to show ourselves approved. Mm-hmm. And it is a lifelong endeavor. It's never over. No, no. You never reach the pinnacle that you think you might reach. Um, is there repentance for opposing the Word of God? Yeah, there is. But if you continue in that preaching um, blasphemy, If you continue in preaching things that are not doctrinally sound, um, there there can very well be a consequence. Mm -hmm. In the Old Testament, it says that God will not... doesn't mean he... I can't use the exact... I don't know if that... But he's talking about taking his name in vain. Now, taking his name in vain is not saying GD all the time. That is Mm -hmm. one way of doing it. Mm -hmm. But it's saying things about God and about the Scriptures that are not true. Correct. Not, not having this attitude, if it be your will, Lord. Uh, but saying, this is God's will. God mm-hmm. spoke to me. He spoke mm-hmm. to me directly. And he said, I should do this, this, and this. Ah, you're be careful. Blas- you're be careful. You could be blaspheming. And what does he say? I will not hold a person who takes my name in vain. Remember what it says? It says, I will not hold them innocent. That doesn't mean it's not forgiven. That means there's judgment for it. Mm -hmm. There's judgment for it. I can't remember the exact word. It's an Old Testament scripture. And if you had a good Sunday school teacher, he would have looked it up and had it up there where he could have given you the exact chapter and verse. But take my word for it, it is true. Turn to Galatians 5, Brendan, and read verse 23. Why don't you read uh, uh, 20 through 23, please? And then we're going to go back to Titus and read chapter 1, verse 1. Idolatry, sorcery, hatred, strife, jealousy, wrath, factions, seditions, heresies, envyings, murderers, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and the like, of which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they who do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another and envying one another. And then, Brenda, he says here that we are to acknowledge the truth. Um, I think it's right here, Mm -hmm. verse 25, In meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, if God prevents, will give them repentance to the acknowledgement of the truth. And then I want you to read Titus 1, 1. Right behind 2 Timothy. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness. So acknowledging the truth. What do you think he means by that? Um, If you acknowledge acknowledge something, something, you you, uh, agree with it and uh, probably going to proclaim it. You may not um, always agree with it, but you do acknowledge that it's right, that it's true. Okay. You may have some problems abiding by it. You may have problems fulfilling it. But what you must do is acknowledge that it's true, mm-hmm. that it's right. Because if you try to twist it and turn it, then the Apostle Paul says, now you are the influence of Satan. Mm-hmm. That's what Satan did when he tempted Christ, right? Mm-hmm. Try to twist and turn the Scriptures. You shall not dash your foot against a stone. The angels shall lift you up. Um, you know, take Scripture that, that means one thing and twist and turn it to mean another thing. Mm-hmm. That is of the devil, and that is dangerous. Mm-hmm. 
So how do we keep ourselves in 2022 from falling into the same pattern and this same, the same sets of issues that the Apostle Paul tells Timothy that he needs to be cautious about and that the people in the church like Hominius and uh, Philetus who are you know, going around preaching heresy, how do we keep ourselves? we got people preaching heresy today. Well, of course we do. Um, it's something that you have to be very careful of, and you do read the Scripture. And, um, you know, if you have questions, talk to your pastor, talk to your Sunday school teacher, teacher and if they don't know the answer right away, I guarantee they'll, they'll, tr they'll find it. Um, and it's just by sticking to what Scripture says and taking it as, as a whole and not pulling one verse out of context to fit whatever it is you're trying to fit it into. What you want to support, basically. Yeah, but yeah, exactly. You don't take things out of context without, you know, reading what's all around it and the scripture reasoning for it. Scripture is interpreted it. with scripture. scripture. Iron right. sharpens iron, right? Right. So is it important that we have some sort of a, a study tool? I think it is. Uh, I, I think it is as long as it's you make sure you get the right one. That's I one mean, reason. I bought that Bible for you right there, mm -hmm. that Schofield Bible, because mm -hmm. I have one. Mm -hmm. um, it's important that we have a good study Bible and that we have references and some commentary to go with it. Now, mm -hmm. I got a Greek dictionary and a whole bookcase full of commentaries. And most, I'm a Sunday school teacher and a deacon. Most people are not going to need that. But you need to have something that you can refer to, mm -hmm. something you can study. Schofield Bible is an excellent choice. An excellent choice. And then um, the other is to make a commitment. Start studying. Mm -hmm. Start it up. Start studying. Spend time in the Word. And don't forget the apostolic command that the Apostle Paul gives in the book of Hebrews, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. Mm -hmm. It's going to be pretty hard to be studying the Word, to be um, educated in the Word, knowledgeable of the Word, be able to defend yourself against false teachings and blasphemy if you're not in church, I if agree. you're not hearing the Word of God spoken out. The rhema spoken Word of God, the powerful Word of God that our pastor preaches under the influence of the Holy Spirit every Sunday mm -hmm. that brings you the meaning, the sense. Apostle Paul used last week the sense of it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, or Nehemiah used when they were preaching. So. Study the show thyself approve, acknowledging the truth. You may not agree, it may upset you, it may prick you just a little bit mm -hmm. to say that that's true. You know, kind of tss, 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 tss. Mm -hmm. but acknowledge it. Very important, otherwise you're doing the work of the devil. See you next week.